Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Samantha D'Alessio. Dr. D'Alessio is an associate professor and the founding program director for the Master of Science program in speech language pathology at Carlo. Prior to Carlo, she served as associate professor and clinic director within the Department of Communication Disorders at California University of Pennsylvania. She has served on local and national committees impacting the direction and recognition of clinical education within the scope of communication sciences and disorders. And she has been published uh, on, on many, many times within this field. Dr. D'Alessio received her doctorate of clinical science in medical speech language pathology from the University of Pittsburgh, a master's of science in speech language pathology from Teachers College, Columbia University, and a bachelor of science in communicative disorders from the University of Rhode Island. I wanna give a big welcome and thank you for joining us today, Dr. D'Alessio. Thank you so much. Um, this is such an exciting time for Carlo as we're designing these new graduate programs. And I'm particularly excited to talk with you today about the new speech language pathology graduate program. I'd like to start by talking a little bit about speech language pathology in general, just as a discipline. And um, speech language pathologists work with individuals across the lifespan to prevent, assess, diagnose, and treat a variety of communication and swallowing disorders. Speech language pathology generally falls under the broader category of communication sciences and disorders. And we're sort of a sister discipline to audiology, which really focuses more on the assessment of hearing disorders. Um, what most people don't really realize is just how vast our scope of practice actually is. Our educational model has generally been unchanged since the 1960s, yet we've seen a lot of advancements in technology and even newer areas of practice like swallowing disorders in our field. Um, we work with uh, kids that have uh, speech and language delays. Uh, we work with cognitive communication disorders, voice disorders, resonance disorders, feeding and swallowing disorders, and complex communication needs that may require augmentative or alternative communication systems. And, and so our, our, our scope of practice is, is quite vast. Um, you'll see, um, particularly as we talk about some of the curriculum, influences of other uh, fields such as psychology, medicine, and education. And even now, um, you'll see uh, clinicians kind of going more towards an education route um, or a medical route in our discipline. So why would somebody want to be a speech language pathologist? And, and I think back to my decision to become a speech language pathologist. And one of the things that really struck me about the field was that it was a health, it's a helping profession and you work very closely one-on-one -on -one with others. Um, it's very gratifying to work with individuals with something as simple as communication and swallowing. And you can really work with a diverse uh, number of populations in diverse settings anywhere from school-based settings to healthcare settings to outpatient offices. Um, what we do really requires a lot of problem solving and critical thinking. This is not a technical field. We really have to learn how to tailor the treatment plan and, and the care plan to the needs of who we're working with. A competitive, a competitive salary and good job security the statistics show that the job outlook is projected to grow 27% through 2028. And I've listed some rankings here on the right side of the screen to really show um, that the profession really has a very good job satisfaction as the profession is usually rated pretty highly in rankings. In terms of the education licensure and certification processes, um, the master's degree has been the entry level degree since the 1960s. Um, although there's always talk of it moving towards a doctorate degree, it hasn't yet. Um, for somebody that wants to go into the profession, typically um, a student will have majored in communication sciences and disorders at the undergraduate level or have um, completed some prerequisite work in the scope of communication sciences and disorders along with some science and math and social science coursework. And they go on to the graduate um, level, um, enter into a, an accredited graduate program. 
uh, graduate from that program and proceed to the certification process, uh, which is typically uh, passing a national exam and completing sort of like a residency uh, for a year where um, you're undergoing more full-time clinical experience under mentorship. And then the other things to consider are the state licensure and teaching certification if the individual is working in the school system. And generally the state licensing and teacher certification processes follow the certification and accreditation processes, although there are some differences from state to state. So some of the important associations, councils, and boards um, to be aware of as we develop a new speech language pathology program um, I've listed here. American Speech Language Hearing Association or ASHA is our national professional uh, association. Uh, the CAA, the Council on Academic Accreditation in Audiology and Speech Language Pathology um, is our, our council that provides oversight to graduate education programs. And they are sort of a semi-autonomous entity within ASHA. So they have some autonomy, but they work with um, ASHA on those policies and procedures of accrediting graduate programs. The CFCC, very similar, um, is the council that oversees the clinical certification process. And again, they are a semi-autonomous entity within ASHA as well. And then the other things to consider are the state licensing boards and the teaching certification boards as they may vary from state to state, but again, generally follow the certification and accreditation standards um, uh, outlined by the CAA, CFCC, and ASHA. So in terms of the accreditation categories, I'd like to point your attention to the first two bullet points, the candidacy applicant and the accreditation candidate. Um, CARLO is a newly developing program, and so we are kind of within those two categories we're looking at right now. Um, newly developing program, uh, programs need to demonstrate compliance with this, the accreditation standards and sort of a logical sequence over a series of years. And so right now, CARLO is this candidacy applicant, um, which just means that we're in the process of uh, completing those accreditation processes. We've submitted our application and kind of moving through that process. We're hoping to reach that status of accreditation candidate by the spring of 2021. And once we achieve that, we can really move forward with um, our admissions process and um, then work towards that last bullet point, which is full accreditation. And again, over a series of years of, of showing and demonstrating compliance with the standards. Um, we hope we're never that accredited uh, on probation, which, which is a, a status that shows that you're not in compliance with the standards. In terms of the actual candidacy process, an institution like Carlo would put forth a notice of intent to indicate that we want to develop a speech language pathology graduate program. And then we would submit the application that shows that our program complies with those standards that application would be reviewed um, and then um, if approved, moved, moved, uh, we would move towards a site visit where the program would provide evidence um, that we are indeed in compliance with the standards as indicated on the application that we submitted. And then that last step would be our decision, um, uh, hopefully achieving that accreditation candidate status. This is to show that the, the number of accredited programs nationwide is definitely growing. Um, as of 2019, there were 281 accredited master's programs nationwide. There are 18 within the state of Pennsylvania. Since 2009, 27 new programs have been accredited. And just in 2020, we're seeing seven new master's programs scheduled for candidacy site visits six that are undergoing application reviews, and 10 more that have submitted letters of intent to apply for candidacy. So this is definitely something that we're seeing um, growth in. This is a, a slide that shows some statistics. This is a survey that goes out to all accredited universities, and I have some national comparisons with Pennsylvania. And this is percent filled capacity first year enrollment divided by capacity. And what you'll see is that 
Uh, consistently since 2008, that capacity is above 90%, sometimes exceeding 100%, and Pennsylvania is right there with national averages. Um, this is really reassuring for new programs like CARLO, um, as it, it indicates that these programs are filling um, in terms of students applying and entering into these programs. Similarly, this graph shows percent of applicants approved for admission since 2010. I don't have all of the data for Pennsylvania. You'll see a slight increase in 2018 and 2019, and I attribute that to the increase in the number of accredited programs that are being developed. Um, but you'll see that those percentages range anywhere from a little below 20% to most recently above 30%. Keeping in mind that most students will apply to more than one school, and um, this certainly shows that this is a competitive market. Carlo's accreditation timeline, I wanted to give you some updates on, uh, on where we are in the process. Um, we've submitted our application and that application was approved as a quality application as of April. Um, we're scheduled for a virtual site visit in November with a, hopefully a positive accreditation decision, um, achieving that uh, accreditation candidate status in February or March of 2021. And if all goes as planned, um, a planned inaugural cohort of 20 students in August of 2021. Our faculty and hiring timeline is consistent with our accreditation timeline. I was hired as program director last October our newest member, Dr. Truett Smith, is our Director of Clinical Education, and she's been with us since June, and she's done a fantastic job with the clinical education side of things. Um, we'll be hiring more faculty this fall, and then the summer of 2021, and then more in the summer of 2022. I'd like to spend a little bit more time on this slide. This is um, now getting into the crux of the actual program itself. And I think it's important to recognize why we made the decisions that we did in the design of this new program. And I've listed some things here to consider and things that we've considered it as we develop this program. A commitment to lifelong learning and critical thinking. I can tell you that this is a hot topic in the scope of speech language pathology. Um, there are ad hoc committees and task forces right now that are specifically looking at this and what graduate programs can do to really emphasize the, uh, the processes of critical thinking and how we can better train our students um, to go out in the field and make really strong clinical decisions so that, uh, that they are practicing and providing the best quality, quality of care to our, um, our patients and our clients. Um, pedagogy, I think um, really being innovative with the teaching methods uh, particularly in this time, this uncertain time with COVID, it has kind of forced us to be creative, but also look at where we're going with teaching and how we can be creative with providing really optimal teaching learning environments for our students that are motivating and that um, are really preparing our students to enter into professional practice with the appropriate knowledge and skills. Um, considerations for the complexities of our scope of practice, as I mentioned, Speech language pathology is a very vast scope of practice and a lot of students will decide to go on more of the education route and others will decide to go on more of the medical route. And as a new program, I think we have to think about that in terms of being a broad based program that really applies to both of those tracks. The quality of clinical education, this is something that is near and dear to my heart it, with experience as being a, a clinical director for eight years. I really did see some of the gaps in the clinical education um, within our field and really thought through that process as I designed the curriculum. One of the really unique things that I've um, done with the curriculum is create these clinical skills labs that are attached to our academic um, coursework. And so that there's this bridging of the theory and practice so that the student will learn something within the classroom and then go directly into the lab and um, uh, apply that um, clinically. And, and that is a, an attempt to sort of lessen the burden of the, the clinical education process on those externship site supervisors once the students go out in the field and have those clinical experiences. 
And that last part, I think, sometimes gets overlooked, which is the congruence of the mission, vision, and goals of the program. Um, this is so very important, for, particularly for a very special institution like Carlo, where it's a very values-driven institution. It's so very important to think about that in terms of program design, but also how it relates back to the college and the university mission, vision, and goals, and making sure that that's all uh, working together in a synergistic way. The next few slides, I'm really not going to read them off the slide because they uh, describe in detail our mission, vision, and goals for the program. And you can certainly go onto our website and read them verbatim, but I wanted to keep them in the slide um, and in the PowerPoint because I wanted to show that congruence. And one of the things that you're going to see here is this interprofessional learning environment. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in the next couple of slides. But you're going to see that throughout the mission and the vision, you'll see that here, the interprofessional collaborative learning environment, and then also in our program goals. And our program goals are quite congruent with some of the rationale um, that uh, we, we used in the design of this program. So certainly we want to prepare our students for the knowledge and skills to enter into professional practice. We want to be innovative. Um, we want to provide this unique interprofessional uh, learning environment. And we want to really be congruent with the values and the history of Carla University in the way of professionalism, self-reflection, ethical accountability, and mutual respect for others, as that's so imperative as you work one-on-one -on -one with individuals on um, communication and swallowing functions. So what makes Carlo's program different? And um, we have to be different because there are other programs in the area and throughout Pennsylvania and the list is growing. And so one of the things that we really are honing in on is this commitment to interprofessional collaborative education. And so what is that? Um, what this means is that students in the program of speech language pathology will train with other disciplines, um, related disciplines, clinical disciplines, such as nursing, occupational therapy, physical therapy, physician assistant, um, and they'll train within this unique interprofessional learning environment to communicate effectively with others, to look at cases more holistically and broad-based, and that's going to trickle down in how they demonstrate and, and, and uh, portray themselves as a professional when they enter into the field. And the evidence is quite strong that shows these kinds of learning environments are effective in providing the best quality of care to those that we serve. Most institutions that have existing curricula are trying to superimpose this idea on top of what they are already um, have developed. Carlo is in a very unique position to be able to develop this from the ground up. And so um, just as the PA program is developing and the OT is uh, developing, um, we can all work together on not just talking about this concept, but really translating it into how we model it as faculty and how we have opportunities for our students to demonstrate it. The emphasis on clinical skills development and bridging that theory uh, to practice gap, as I mentioned, one of the examples of those clinical skills labs and really focusing on clinical skills development. The value-centered teaching learning climate and ensuring the congruence of the university mission, vision, and goals of mercy, compassion, humility, and respect. That transformational educational experience through innovation, state-of-the-art equipment, understanding some of the resources that Carlo already has. You know, the nursing program has this beautiful simulation lab, and what a beautiful way to have this inter interprofessional interaction um, than utilizing some of these resources that we already have, which are really state-of-the-art. That em emphasis on critical thinking and lifelong learning um, and really honing in not just critical thinking on, in general, but explicitly understanding what the process of clinical thinking, critical thinking is and how do we apply that to assessing and managing clinical cases. So interprofessional collaborative education, I wanted to talk more specifically about some of the actual initiatives and give you some more specific examples of what we're, we're working on. Um, again, this is inspired by the view that effective team collaboration improves the quality of clinical service delivery. 
Um, we are working on an interprofessional clinical space. Uh, right now, we are going to be have, we're, going, we're setting up a speech language pathology uh, clinic temporarily in the Hopkins lab on campus. And the long-term goal as we start to see these new construction pro projects on campus is to expand that to an interprofessional clinic where speech uh, language pathology students are working with social work, psychology, education, OTPT, and they're really kind of practicing within that interprofessional space. We have interprofessional coursework, so students will be taking coursework not only within their cohort of speech language pathologist uh, students, but also from other related programs across the university. Um, PA, nursing, respiratory care, education, they'll be taking coursework and, and working clinically with these other programs routinely. And then interprofessional projects and special collaborations, whether it's through research or other service learning projects, um, that is, um, those are all certainly initi uh, initiatives that we are moving towards um, for short and long-term goals. In terms of the curriculum design, it is a five semester 60 credit program. There are hybrid face to face and online modalities. Um, there are both education and medical based coursework within the curricula curriculum. Um, some of the unique course series that you um, might not see in other graduate programs, but uh, maybe more unique to Carlo um, is the fact that we will have a gross head and neck uh, anatomy uh, lab uh, with the cadaver lab through the biology department, another interprofessional opportunity, um, an interprofessional critical thinking course series where students will learn explicitly the process of critical thinking and then apply that to small group case-based uh, learning where students will have to manage cases on an interprofessional level, an interprofessional ethics course, a research capstone course series where students will plan a research project over a series of semesters, and those clinical skills labs that are attached to those academic courses um, so that there's a clear translation of um, theory to clinical practice. In terms of our clinical education, we have a mix of on and off campus experiences. Um, on campus, we will have an on campus speech language pathology clinic that will be at no cost to the community to provide access to speech and language services to those that may have challenges in finding access to those services. Um, we'll be using some of the existing resources on campus. Some of the things that make Carlo, Carlo unique are the fact that there is a campus laboratory school and early learning center. And those are valuable resources to provide um, speech and language services, whether they are through screening, assessment, or treatment. Um, another initiative that we're looking at doing is a summer reading um, lang a literacy language clinic. Uh, we'll be working with the education department and the reading specialist program on providing uh, language literacy services to the community for a summer program, and that will be a clinical experience for the students. Um, off campus, there will be school based health care and then a special elective option for students that may have a particular interest in an area of practice and an out of state option for externships in the last semester. Our admissions requirements are pretty consistent with other programs. The one difference that we will have um, is that we will not require the GRE. We're accepting students from all backgrounds, whether you have a major in communication sciences and disorders, or you're, you've just completed some of the prerequisite coursework that we're requiring. Um, we will have a uh, personal interview uh, for our students. I'm happy to say that our applications are open uh, we're using a centralized application service called SIDCAS. Over 70% of programs use this uh, application process. Uh, and a snapshot of our applications plat uh, platform is listed on the right hand of your screen. Um, and I encourage you to spread the word that if you know anybody that's interested in applying to, to please log on and, and apply. Our admission timeline, um, our applications have been open through SIDCAS since uh, July 15th. We are looking to close that uh, application process uh, February 15th of 2021. Uh, at that point, we will begin hopefully sending out acceptance letters um, pending our candidacy decision. We are not permitted to send out any accepted, uh, acceptance letters until we get the go-ahead from our accrediting body that we've achieved that accreditation candidate status. 
um, uh, so that once we do, we'll send the, out those letters. Um, it kind of works really nicely in terms of timeline as that's typically when we would normally send out acceptance letters anyway. Um, and again, if all goes well, um, projected to admit our inaugural cohort of 20 students pending that candidacy, candidacy decision um, in the spring, um, uh, August of 2021. This is a snapshot of our program website, which is currently live on Carlo's website. I encourage you to go to the website and um, take a look at it. We have loads of information in terms of specific coursework, our mission, vision, goals, our strategic plan, um, application processes and admission requirements. So I encourage you to take a peek at that. Um, I have my references here, but I'm gonna keep this slide up um, oh, that has our, our website information. And at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any uh, questions for the group. There, there are some questions. Well, first of all, um, let me just sh give a shout out. There is a kudo remark to, Kudos to Carlo and to you, Dr. D'Alessio, for getting this going at Carlo. Um, you may be aware already that we've had, we had speech language pathology as a major several years ago. And so I know um, alums who have that degree are thrilled that this program's coming back to the university. Yes, um, I, I think that's fantastic. Question is, is there a minimum state pass rate similar to what there is the NCLEX for nursing? Yeah, so um, that there is a pass rate. The students have to have a, a certain score on the pass rate. Um, generally, uh, uh, for the national exam, generally students will take that exam in the last uh, semester that they are in a graduate program, although some will wait until they graduate to take that exam. Um, and I believe you can take it a couple of times and then you have to have a period of time where you wait before you can take it again. But Typically, graduate programs um, have a pretty high pass rate across the board um, in terms of surveys. I know you mentioned in your admissions process that um, people could apply even if they don't have an undergraduate degree in speech pathology. Are there, are there undergraduate programs that you're familiar with at Carlo that could help prepare students to enter this program? Carlo, again, this um, uh, Carlo is developing uh, a new health sciences undergraduate major. And this major um, has been approved and, and we are looking to launch it. Um, and it's to help Carlo students at the undergraduate level who have interest in these new graduate programs. Um, obviously speech language pathology and the PA program are um, the first programs um, to be developed, um, but PT and OT are, are coming up soon as well. And so the idea is, is that will provide a pathway for students to go, uh, Carlo students to enter into the, these new programs. Terrific, and that's a three-year degree, correct? Is that? The yes, I believe it's a three-year undergraduate degree. And I think there's some information up on the website, just hot off the press. I believe they're, they're starting to put more and more information up about that undergraduate degree. Great. Another question is, will there be training with the medical schools in the area? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, no, not, not specifically with the medical schools, but we are um, working uh, very closely with the nurse practitioner program, the PA program um, on, on coursework and just providing more of that interprofessional experience, um, whether it be through simulation um, or um, case-based learning and, and kind of planning out cases. Um, and then we're also growing our, our list of externship sites and um, working with some of the area healthcare facilities as well as the schools on establishing really unique um, externship experiences for our students. And will, will the students who, um, as they go through these externships, will that, how long is the externship? You may have said that and I missed it. Sure. Um, so there'll be a minimum of two externship sites, one school-based and one healthcare-based. Um, they'll start that process in their second year. The fall of their second year will be their first off-campus experience, and then they'll do another one in the spring, their last semester, and then they'll have the option of kind of splitting that last semester half and half, eight weeks in, you know, healthcare or school, and then the other eight weeks in an elective. So if a student is particularly interested in voice and they really want to do a special 
experience in a voice clinic, um, they can kind of split up that last uh, semester so that they get a little more experience in that area of interest. Terrific, terrific. I think we are at our stopping point. Um, Dr. D'Alessio, thank you so much for being here today and sharing uh, information about this new program uh, at Carlo. We wish you all the best as you continue to plan and get that accreditation. And I wanna encourage all of you to please join us next, um, I'm sorry, Wednesday, August 19th, to hear from our guests, Ryan Scott, Carlo's Director of the Social Justice Institutes, and Malia Johnston, Director of Equity Inclusion at Carlo, as they discuss a timely topic of racism, a pandemic within a pandemic. Thank you again for joining us today and have a great Wednesday, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.